service was the United States Air Force. Susan Breach, United States Army. My name is Tom Bradley and I was in the U.S. Navy. Mike Van Tiger, U.S. Army. Bob Morse, I was in the Army. I was drafted in 1954. I was at home and I went down to the mailbox and I got my Notice, and I brought it up to the house and I laid it down and my dad said, what's this? And I said, I don't know. And it said, greetings. You've been selected by your friends and neighbors. <laughs> and I said, these are my friends. <laughs> so I got drafted and they, uh, they said it'd be over about air in uh, about two weeks and the bus will pick you up. And I went to Fort Laird Wood, Missouri for basic training. And while I was down there, they wanted to know if anybody could type. Never heard of computers then. And uh, so I said, yeah. So then I went to, uh, I had 16 weeks down there, basic. And then I went to Fort Lee, Virginia for a clerk type of school and then to Fort Lewis, Washington, and then I was overseas 19 months. I went to Alaska, and Alaska wasn't a state then, so we got overseas pay, and I stayed up there. I was a uh, uh, depot uh, specialist in the Quartermaster Corps, and then in the in uh, I worked as a parts man in a motor pool, and I worked uh, nights in a motor pool up there. And then I worked on the farm up to Palmer in the daytime, which is pretty unusual for service people. I was in the service uh, two years. My time just came up and I got drafted because of that. And I was uh, about 19 when I got drafted. I joined the Air Force because uh, back during that time, there was a lottery. And uh, you went and signed up at the uh, drafts board and at the county level, and uh, uh, you got a number. and. If you had a high number, you may not have been called up for a while. If you had a low number, you might even you might get called up soon. And so I had a relatively high number, so I went to two years to college. And the night I graduated, the next day I had draft papers, uh, draft notice in the in the mail. So uh, I turned around and I went back to Clear Lake, Iowa. Uh, and uh, went to the uh, recruiter's office. 
and I showed him the, my uh, draft papers and he asked me, he said, would you like to join the Air Force? And I said, mm -hmm. yeah. And he took my draft papers and he tore them in half, threw them in the trash and swore me in. And so the Army would have been two years, uh, the Air Force was four, and uh, uh, so that's, that's how I got into the Air Force. Basically enjoying for mainly the college uh, money at the first. Um, I left two weeks after high school, I was 17 years old. When I turned 18, I was on the firing range, qualifying with my M16 and basic training. I joined uh, when I graduated college to travel the world and to get higher pay than a beginning teacher in Iowa. And I was commissioned as a second lieutenant and uh, retired after 21 years as a major. I was getting close to being uh, uh, drafted into the Army and I really didn't want to go into the Army and I was thinking about joining the Air Force but I had a friend of mine that was, uh, I, I had two years of college that uh, would have enlisted me as a E3 instead of joining as a seaman recruit and uh, when I told him that I was thinking about joining the Air Force, he told me, uh, he said, you know, the Navy has the best schools, so you'd be better off with joining the Navy. So I joined the Navy in uh, June 8th, 64, and I was, uh, let's see, uh, June 8th, 64, and I was 21 years old at the time when I enlisted. And even though I went in as a seaman, I could not put on that, uh, I was getting paid as a seaman, but I was still a seaman recruit because that was my first duty station. And that was in California. Uh, I served 27 and a half years. Uh, 27 and a half years and I, my first duty station was the hardest one. Uh, and I was in the Naval Security Group uh, which caused me to be on the ship that I was on, the USS Liberty. It was a technical research ship. Okay. Uh, no, actually, I was very fortunate. I didn't have any combat. And uh, so I was very fortunate. The Korean War was winding down and uh, they never did, I don't think they ever did sign a truce for years after that, but uh, the service was real good to me. And I'd do it again in a minute. They wouldn't want me now, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I had a lot of memories. Uh, I, I got, through with basic training and I was shipped to uh, Trieste, Italy. And that kind of turned out to be the garden spot of the country. Had good duty there. You can go. The most memorable moment was the first time I got to go to Mass and celebrate Mass with the uh, uh, and it was the first time really away from my family and uh, away from home. And uh, it was really, a, really a, a, a very blessing time to be able to go to mass and worship. I would say the most memorable moment would be um, working with other units, um, sharing information on uh, training with budgeting and the accounting um, also working um, with all the um, battalions and brigades, a lot of the camaraderie, um, the discipline, the respect, um, 
the honor that the service gets you, I would say that's the most memorable. Probably one of the other um, additional moments was we were we were part of the 10th Mountain Division and up in Fort Drum, New York. And we were out on a field exercise about middle of January. And we uh, were to stay overnight. And I had a first sergeant that uh, we had pup tents. We put up pup tents. And when we woke up the next morning, uh, we had to actually dig out of our pup tent because there was so much snow over it. And then as we were marching back through um, to the um, gathering point where we had our uh, command center, uh, myself and eight other guys <clears throat> got in between a mother bear and a cub. Um, and the mother bear started chasing me and they had to kill her before it got to me. So that was, that was another interesting, fun moment. <laughs> Memorable moment. Guys, I don't have anything to compare to our uh, greatest generation, uh, World War II vets and the World War I vets that are all gone these days and we're losing our World War II vets rapidly. Um, but I really enjoyed being able to live in different areas of our nation and around the world in Korea as well as different countries in Europe as uh, living there rather than being there as a tourist. So I did enjoy what being active duty afforded me then being able to do that rather than being a tourist because you get a whole different perspective of doing it when you live there. Several short tours. Uh... I got sent to Long Beach before I went to A school, and then I went to uh, Treasure Island for ETA school because they did not have a CTMA school. I went from there to uh, Bear Island for uh, solid state training uh, because that was the way uh, the ET school was not doing any solid state training at, at that time. And from there, uh, I got orders to uh, the USS Liberty, and on my way to the USS Liberty, uh, Debbie and I got married, and uh, let's see, June, was it June 8th? No, it wasn't June 8th. February 5th. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> February 5th. Uh, and then uh, I went, I went on from there to uh, uh, school in San Angelo, Texas, Texas to go to school for uh, the communications clock that, that our security group stations maintain. Uh, but Deb and I got married on the way to there and then uh, we went from there to Norfolk to uh, report aboard the ship. And Deb left me off at the head of the pier uh, I had no idea what was when I would see her again, and uh, we had found a place to live. So she took the car and went on there, and I got checked aboard the ship, and they told me that uh, they were on Liberty and to go home. <laughs> so then I had to try to figure out. I had to take a taxi to get to, to the house because I knew I wasn't going to be able to call Deb, who didn't have a telephone, and. From the, from there, then we we served uh, on the ship for uh, I think it was three years, two years, two years, eighteen months or something like that, and we operated off of the west coast of Africa. Uh, and like I said, our our ship was an intelligence ship. We could gather just about any type of signal that, that was being presented. And uh, I was a CTM, Cryptologic Technician Maintenance. So when the operators broke the equipment, I got to got to uh, fix it. And uh, June 8th, 64, uh, or 67, uh, we were having, uh, we just secured from a drill, a general quarters drill, and the uh, uh, captain had mentioned that he could see on the horizon 
smoking up coming up from an Arab oil field and and uh, so when we secured from the general quarter station I went up to see if I could see what the captain was looking at and I got up to the main deck and as soon as I got up on the main deck and started down the side of the ship I I heard some noise never heard it before but realized what it was it was a plane that was attacking the ship and you could hear the shells bouncing off the ship and I just proceeded immediately to my general quarter station um, and I knew that uh, that we were under attack and I was about halfway to my GQ station before the sound uh, general quarters was sound and then when I got to my general quarter station I reached back to scratch my back and when I probed my hand back it had blood on it. Uh, I had been hit by old piece of shrapnel or something but it was just enough to make me bleed and uh, so then uh, then when the uh, they stat passed the word to stand by for torpedo attack and everybody on the ship just figured that that was we were going to be gone because whenever we'd hold a drill and we'd throw a hand grenade over the side of the ship it would just shake the ship and, and uh, because of it, it was an older ship it's been rehabbed so everybody, everybody just knew that we were gone. And when the, uh, when the torpedo hit, uh, everything went black and I couldn't see, uh, but I was in a space where I knew where I could get to the, the exit of the space. So I started across the room and I knew where there was a wall and there was a door over here. And then on the other side of that door was a ladder that went up to the next deck up so I uh, went and uh, started across the room stumbling over everything because the torpedo had just, uh, it, was, it was pretty bad. And it knocked a big hole in the side of the ship, 25 by 39 feet, I think it was. And the next thing I ran to, into over there was that ladder. What I was tromping, you know, what was causing me to trip and, and uh, almost fall and everything was that wall. It had been... Uh, it had been blown down, I, but I ran into the ladder. I got on the ladder and I was on up and out of the space. But when I left the space, I was probably uh, walking in water up to my knees and that whole compartment eventually flooded. Uh, and then uh, we got up, I got up to the main deck and helped with uh, one of the uh, sailors that had, been, that had been hit pretty bad he ended up dying uh, the result of that uh, casually was that we had we had less than 300 people on board a hundred and something 190 th 190 some were injured and 34 killed uh, and I was just fortunate to be uh, to be uh, able to tell you this right now uh, anyway uh, I, I stayed in for 27 and a half years and went to uh, many duty stations overseas security group uh, stations and then the last two tours I had was as the command master chief I was the senior senior enlisted person on board for my last two commands. Service treated me real good. And I was in two years and then came home and got married about a year after that, so. Uh. <laughs> well, I, uh, I don't know. I fly the flag every day and I just, I think it's, it was worth it to me just to uh, live in this country. And uh, I'd do it again in a New York minute. Uh, it, it was just a small part that I did. One of my grandkids wrote me a letter one day and he said, Grandpa, what award did you win? And I said, I didn't win. 
any of them. I just uh, did what they told me to do. But I, I was real lucky. Yeah, I suppose it changed me more than I really realized, but I left my girlfriend at home. And I got a service and she was still waiting on me. <laughs> But I, uh, I had had good duty. This, this service was a tremendously great experience, a, a growing experience, a maturing experience. Uh, growing up on the farm, I was always busy doing chores. I didn't have time to, uh, wasn't allowed to participate in sports because I needed to get home and do chores. My dad was a cripple. And uh, so, when, uh, as I went through school, it was kind of a, just something I had to do uh, to get through school because to get home at night and then do chores the first thing in the morning, milk cows at five o'clock in the morning. And uh, so my grades were, were, were good through high school, but I really didn't put the effort that I should have. And when I got into the service and the, and the competition was there and I had the opportunity, I was asked to go to a uh, non-commissioned officer's uh, leadership school. And so I accepted and I just made a deal with myself to do the best I could once in my time in, in, a, in a scholarship situation. And uh, so I thought, I'm just going to do the very best I can and just see what happens. And turns out when the awards night, well, they had about five different categories of awards. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this buddy going up and that buddy going up. And, and I'm sitting there and they had all the awards out. And then they said, there's one last award. And it goes to someone that was right there at the top of every class. Uh, and he just exceeded in all the categories. And they called my name for honor graduate. And so that was a, a very memorable moment for me. Just to see for myself what I could do if I really put all that I had into it. Yes. During the basic training, we had several tests that tested all our different skills and knowledge in different subjects. And the one that I came to, it was foreign language. And uh, I never had any foreign language in school or high school or anything. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. And I went, started down through the test, and I don't remember what type of reasoning I used, but when it was all said and done, I was called in for an interview and they said, we want you to go to language school. You scored very high in foreign language. And I was just floored. And uh, so I went along with it and I said, well, what do, you, what do you want? We need Chinese linguists. And but they said, you have your choice if you want Russian or Chinese. As a little tot, I overheard what my parents were saying. And at that time, there was a Cold War with Russia. And, oh, I didn't want anything to do with Russia. And I thought, Chinese, I don't know anything. You know, there's not a whole lot to, about the Chinese in, in, in the social world. So I thought, well, I'll take Chinese. Well, then I found out that it's probably the hardest language to learn of any foreign language. And uh, so I went into Chinese linguist training for a year. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I ended up uh, as an Air Force non-commissioned officer, uh, less than 2% of 5% that fly in the service. And uh, I logged over 2,500 hours of flying uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin off Chinese and the Vietnam coast. 
and uh, uh, I had a top secret security, top secret cryptolog cryptologic, cryptographic uh, communications. It was the highest clearance you could get. It took over a year to get, and there was people running up and down the streets in our town of Garner, and my dad got very uncomfortable why his son was being asked all these questions and why the family was being interviewed so intensively and so much research on the family. And, and uh, he was very nervous about that, but it was, it was uh, necessary to get the type of clearance that, that I was going to be exposed to the type of information that I was uh, collecting. And so by the time I finished one year of Chinese school, uh, it took a year for the clearance to, to, uh, to be awarded. Some of the people from my class studied a whole year of Chinese and then didn't get to use it at all. Uh, but uh, the clearance went through and, and the rest is history. I, I learned Chinese and I got to the point where I could, I knew by voice recognition tower controllers in China. And a tremendous experience, just a tremendous experience. Um, I would say the service helped me become a better person. First, it, uh, I grew up probably faster than I wanted to, but uh, it helped me realize that uh, um, understanding that people have a lot of um, issues that you don't see and you can help people um, help other uh, servicemen um, through their their hard times too. It how the army changed me. It made me much more respectful and disciplined. Uh, growing up on a farm, my parents and I was pretty respectful to begin with. Uh, it made me realize how much my father and I had in common. And we recently lost him, he passed away. And uh, I would say that it made me even more respectful, disciplined, and appreciative of our way of life, our values and our freedoms. I think my upbringing had a lot to do with uh, the success that I had in the military. Uh, you know, I was I was used to being told what to do, and so you know when I when I had to follow somebody's rules or somebody told me something to do, uh, I would go ahead and get it done, and uh, it just turned out to be uh, just a very rewarding. Uh, career. Uh, the family could go with me on all my duty stations after we after that uh, after boot camp and, and when I was on my way to my first sh uh, duty as uh, shipboard. And uh, Deb, Deb and the kids got to go with me everywhere we went. We we had uh, uh, places like uh, Morocco and Edsel, Scotland. ADAC Alaska and ADAC Alaska we did two times and uh, you know, Pensacola Florida uh, Winter Harbor Maine <coughs> and I think that was that's a one. I, I said that so uh, Winter Harbor Maine Canitra Morocco that was up Canitra Morocco was where we went the uh, first overseas tour and uh, my, my wife uh, says the one thing that she can remember about uh, going to Morocco was she was uh, pregnant when we got there and pregnant when we left. <laughs> we, and we had, uh, yeah, we were there for two years. Our, our oldest son was born in Morocco. So. The services talk about uh, being the spearhead of equality between the genders and the and the races and everything uh 
part of that uh, is a shortcoming. Uh, they still have work to do to make that a true statement uh, because um, women, we get equal pay as much as the men per rank, per job. That is true. But as long as the females are favored and don't, if, if they don't have to do the same task exactly as the male has to do for a particular job, then they're not making a true statement that equality is the same 100%. If they water down the task, then, then it's not equal. It's not equality. Like an infantryman, if they water down the standard for a woman to be an infantryman, then what a male has to do to be an infantryman, then it's not fair. I have no problem if a woman competes and meets the same exact exact standard that a man has to do then my hat's off to her and go go get it but if she can't meet the same exact standard then then she doesn't cut it and she shouldn't be allowed to do that that MOS that task that specialty skill this antenna right here was one of my antennas this hand down clear up here on top was the highest point on the ship and I had to crawl up there and I repaired it and uh, took that one down and had it, got it fixed. And if you look here on this ship, uh, yeah. this, uh, this antenna right here wasn't there anymore. It, it, it got knocked off and a bunch of the others antennas. I don't think we had, I think all the antennas were uh, not working except uh, somebody was able to wire up a new one, one other antenna, which we got word out to the fleet, and but nobody came. <laughs> uh, there were planes sent out from the from their ships and the aircraft carriers, and those uh, those planes got called back. So that was right during the Arab-Israeli Six-Day War, and they they didn't want us involved in it. <laughs> President Johnson yes. and Secretary mm -hmm. McNamara, Secretary of State McNamara, did not want to go to war with Israel because the Vietnam was, War was going on. An election was coming up. President Johnson dearly wanted to be elected. And um, they just kind of shoved the USS Liberty aside. And the USS Liberty is the only United States ship on record that has been taken a direct hit from enemy fire that has not been investigated by Congress. Congress, Congress. will not open it up. They will not touch it. They don't want to hear from anybody about and, it. And we've, we've tried numerous times to uh, have people go before Congress to uh, talk about the ship, but uh, you know, nothing, nothing has ever, it was never investigated. And all of these years, we've never held Tom and I and the majority of the crew, never, we, we, we never held the, the people of Israel responsible. It was the military of Israel that um, got it all wrong. <laughs> so uh, okay. that's where we're at to this day. It's been like this for a lot of years, 50 plus years.